This is a short video discussing issues relating to corporate groups. So what we've got here is a fictitious group, ABC Limited, and this group has a holding company, which you'll see up here. And the holding company is in fact publicly listed. So we have shareholders who are owning shares in the holding company. Now one of the things that we know is that shareholders own shares in the company, they don't own shares in the company's property. So just because you're a shareholder of the holding company does not mean that you will own any of the holding company shares in any subsidiaries. So we have a number of subsidiaries here and looking at this particular business, it seems to be operating in at least two locations. So we've got the ABC Penrith store and the ABC Liverpool store. Now imagine this is a listed retail company. So they've got stores in those two locations. Each of those stores controls some assets and that might even just be a lease, for example, might be some lease and equipment, although we do have an asset holding entity over here. And we've also got a HR company over here. So one possibility is that these two operating subsidiaries are basically just corporate shells and all the assets are over here and then licensed to the two subsidiaries for use. The staff who work in the subsidiaries are then employed by ABC staff. Now, the two operating subsidiaries are dealing with external creditors. So these might be suppliers who are supplying goods to these two subsidiaries so that they can then conduct their trading activities. But if we stop and say, well, who owns the shares in these different companies? According to this organizational chart, it's ABC Holding, and you'll note that that is a proprietary limited company. Who owns all of the shares in ABC Holding? That's ABC Limited, which is a publicly listed company. So ABC Limited has a variety of shareholders, individuals, companies that own all of its shares and those shares are traded on the stock market. The main asset of ABC Limited is the shares that it holds in ABC Holding. The main asset of ABC Holding are the shares that it holds in staff, assets, and the two operating subsidiaries, and then also the shares that it owns in ABC Finance. So the role of ABC Finance is to obtain external finance. So that might be from banks, that might be from investors who are buying up debentures that are issued by ABC Finance. And then what ABC Finance does is it provides the funding for each of the subsidiaries to operate. Now one of the problems, practical problems, that an external creditor like a trade creditor is going to face here is that of course all of the companies have very similar names. So it's highly likely that the trade creditor believes well we're dealing with the ABC group. And if this is a large listed public company then a trade creditor might assume that the individual entities that they're dealing with are in fact uh, asset rich companies because it's the ABC group. But what we know is that that's not the case, that the trade creditor only has a contractual relationship, a debt owed by the operating subsidiary. And because they're only dealing with the subsidiaries, they do not have any rights against the asset holding entity, against the ultimate holding entity, or the group parent company. So their rights are down here to the operating subsidiary. Now, 
If the trade creditors are smart, then they will look at the financial position of those subsidiaries and then say, hang on, they don't have any assets. How am I going to get paid? Now, presumably, they're going to be supplying subject to retention of title and they'll have perfected their interest on the PPSR. But if they really want to protect themselves, then what they need to get is some form of right to the assets over here. So they could do that using either a cross guarantee covering all the companies in the group, but that might be a problem because perhaps the contract that the external financiers have with ABC Finance is that ABC Finance will not give any further security over its assets. And chances are the external financiers will definitely have a group uh, guarantee a cross guarantee amongst all of the members of the group. So the main lesson to take out of this example is basically know who you are dealing with. The trade creditors should know it's a proprietary limited company. That means that they're not going to go after the shareholders. They're not going to be able to go after the shareholders. And basically they're going to be limited to those assets. And if they're worried about that, either don't do business with them or make sure that you get some other legal entity to give you a guarantee. Now that's fine with a trade creditor, but of course one of the, the practical problems and policy problems here is that what happens if you have no uh, bargaining power, if you have no choice about who it is that you're actually dealing with. So if we think about, for example, a tort claimant, that could be a real problem. So you're not a trade creditor, rather what you are is you're a customer who comes into the Liverpool store and unfortunately you have an accident. And you then want to sue the Liverpool store under negligence because that's how you're going to get compensation. Well, the problem there is you didn't think you were going to get hurt. So it's not as if before you went into the store, you could check their insurance, you could check their asset base, or you could say before you go into the store, oh, I want you to get ABC assets to give me a a guarantee supported by their assets. So clearly that doesn't work for non-contractual claimants, for involuntary creditors. And that's one of the policy questions about uh, providing multiple layers of limited liability inside of a corporate group. So this is just a short overview of corporate groups.